Good morning. Uh, this is Wednesday, January 27th, 2021, Senate Judiciary Committee uh, meeting. Our first item on the agenda today is S30, an act relating to prohibited possession of firearms in child care facilities, hospitals, and certain buildings. We have a number of witnesses scheduled, um, and I hope we can continue somewhat of a focus on um, what are some of the other laws that impact um, people uh, carrying in places where there's signs that clearly say you're not supposed to carry firearms. So uh, with that, we'll start, uh, continue with Chris Bradley, who we left off with last week on this subject. Chris represents the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen Clubs. Chris, welcome again. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sears. Um, my uh, name is Chris Bradley. I am the president and executive director of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Uh, we represent approximately 60 clubs uh, across the state of Vermont uh, with approximately 11,000 members, not counting their families. Um, uh, to review, I think uh, I, I started off my testimony last week detailing some of the uh, uh, statutes already on the books having to do with a large number of the concerns that were expressed in Wednesday's testimony, having to do with uh, threatening um, or, or untoward behavior. Um, interestingly, I didn't hear from any of those individuals that, that specifically indicated that firearms in any location was a problem. Um, it seemed to me that there was more uh, threatening involved, both uh, verbally as well as uh, on social media and the like. Um, so I guess uh, to review, I believe I listed uh, something like eight statutes previously. I'd like to add another two to that. I believe there's 10 that in some way uh, address that. However, um, and, and all of those or most of those have some um, consideration for intent uh, or knowing. So that there has to be some intent or knowing involved. Um, I believe I also relayed uh, the fact that Vermont is one of the, set, uh, the second safest state in the nation um, and that uh, what we're trying to do apparently is to make Vermont even safer. Um, so I, I guess uh, we have um, a slew of laws already on the books, but what I understand uh, with S30 is that we now apparently need a law to address the act of carrying a firearm in let's call it an unusual location. Um, I'd like to start by, by, by suggesting that the group I represent um, is uh, incredibly cognizant of the firearms that they own and how those firearms may be interpreted uh, while being carried by others. Um, I believe the vast majority of the people I represent would never consider walking in to one of these facilities openly carrying uh, at all. Uh, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, and I guess, you know, while we're talking about uh, uh, large government operations, I've served on the Northfield Select Board. And uh, as a selectman, you get put into situations where you have to enforce zoning, where certain people in town may have property taken away. Uh, I have been in a situation uh, numerous times where uh, I felt threatened um, and uh, was threatened. Uh, and fortunately, Vermont allows me to take precautions against that. Um, I, I myself, uh, in considering S30, um, we don't believe that there's really any evidence uh, that, that such a bill is needed. Furthermore, I think we heard in testimony on Wednesday uh, that there wasn't any evidence that such prohibitions even exist. Um, I, I guess I would like to uh, understand the intent of S30 um, is to provide a mechanism that would allow a firearm to be removed from a location where it was not uh, desired to be. Um, and at the end of the testimony, I raised uh, VSA, 13 VSA 3705, um, and I have now 
supplied a document to you of pictures that I took around central Vermont of locations that have a various signs. I started with Maple Woods with the no shirts um, uh, um, signage. I, I then went to the pavilion. Uh, that seems to have a sign present. Uh, obviously the state house has a sign present. And then I went to Central Vermont Hospital. And within five feet of each other, there are two signs, as you can see in the, the document, that say no firearms and even more expansively, no weapons. Um, I submit to you today that the force of law behind every one of those signs is 3705. Um, uh, Senator Sears, with, with your permission, uh, I ended by asking Eric Fitzpatrick a question concerning 3705, and I was wondering if, if he could speak to uh, clarifying my question. Um, that would be highly unusual for me to ask, but I do want to, once you're finished with your testimony, I would like to ask Eric questions about what kind of current laws are available. Um, so I, I would rather do it that way, oh, the same way, but rather than having a witness ask ledge counsel a question, I think it's more appropriate. If, but that's one of my major questions is Thank you, what sir. else is available to try to prevent people where it's signed. And I, you know, it could be the price chopper down in my neighborhood too. that puts up a sign and says, you're not allowed to carry weapons in the store. I, I thank you for your guidance, Senator, and I'll continue. Um, I, I guess the, the statement was re repeatedly made in testimony on, on Wednesday, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there is no law on the books today that would address having a firearm in a location where it was not wanted. And I, I have to suggest, and we'll seek clarification later, I believe that there is a law, I believe it's in use today, um, and in fact, it's far more expansive than what's being called for in S30. Um, I believe the criteria that was sought for was we wanted a criminal violation. Couldn't be civil, it had to be criminal. 3705 is a criminal violation um, and it provides the same, if you, I'm, I'm a computer systems guy. When I look at developing a process, I, I go through a flow chart to say how, it, how does a process work? And when I flow chart, how S30 would work in terms of enforcement. It's an identical flow chart to the same enforcement that would be behind 3705. So I, I, I guess I need to just clarify the statement that, it, that if there is a law in the books today that addresses having a firearm in a prohibited location and it can be dealt with today. Um, so as far as dropping down into the weeds, as far as parking lots and, and other weapons and, and knowing and intent. I have to ask, why do we need a re completely redundant bill that the only difference between 3705 and what is proposed in S30 is its penalty phase? Um, I believe S, uh, uh, 3705 calls for three months and or $500 fine. I believe it hasn't been changed since 2013, and it may be appropriate to up the penalties related to that statute as a suggestion. Um, I had really hoped to approach this, uh, my testimony today as a discussion to, to discuss with, with this deliberative body, the need for a completely redundant bill. Um, when we already have the capability, in fact, more expansive capability, uh, according to 3705, it's a property rights issue. Someone can make the statement that they don't want a firearm on their property or a business can do that. Um, and in fact, that there, there's a consumer aspect to this that um, if you have such a sign up, people can make informed decisions as to whether they wanna to go to that location or not. Um, it is, it becomes a property rights issue and it's a, it, under that umbrella, I virtually have nothing to say. Under a gun bill that clearly is intended to be expansive and to be expanded, when we already have this coverage, I, I, I'm really having a difficult time 
understanding this. Um, I, I, I guess I, I don't want to continue belaboring this point. Um, I'm more than happy to, to drop into uh, the, the weeds, if you will, on all the, the issues that we see with this bill. I just don't see why we need to go to this effort. But by the same token, wouldn't we, um, we did pass laws regarding schools. Yes, sir. Um, we did pass laws regarding courts. Yes, sir. Um, so somebody found that necessary. And I was here when we did both the schools. And I, I may not have been here when we did the courts. I can't remember. But I know I was here during the schools. I remember um, dealing with um, your group and other groups at the time um, who were um, concerned about uh, parking lots, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. The same questions that come up here. But um, well, but Senator, we evidently decided we needed those laws then. If, I, if I, I could, I see this as an extension. Um, I understand your argument. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, Senator. Uh, yeah. with, with schools, with airports, with courts a significant investment has been made to provide equipment and personnel to enforce that. Um, have any of us tried to go to a school recently and actually gain access? It has become exceedingly difficult. Courts, um, I can enter a court without concern because I'm being screened by equipment. I know there's a, a, a uniformed law enforcement there to, uh, to enforce that nobody should be acting in an untoward fashion. And the same is true with airports. Um, mm -hmm. The fact is that you can see an air, a, a firearm in an airport. I've flown by checking a firearm in an airport. Uh, the real concern here, Senator, is that it, it's, it's either we're going to get serious and, and protect our people by taking the steps necessary to ensure that protection. And in fact, I can even point at one state that basically says, if you do disarm, uh, an individual uh, that has a right to self-defense that the location takes on the responsibility for their safety. So uh, I, I, I look at this and say, yes, um, schools were an issue. I have to say, however, that I think we've seen that schools have become targets. Columbine, Parkland, possibly Fairhaven. Um, th these, these are situations where a piece of paper has been put up to say, you can't do this. And we heard in testimony that those prohibitions don't work. There's no evidence that they, they work. Yet here we have 3705 that clearly shows if someone is in a place where they shouldn't, let's be candid, in order for any of these things to work, law enforcement has, has to be present, correct? Yep. So if, if law enforcement has to be present, either they're there already because we've invested that money to have them there, or someone is going to have to make a call to have them come. Well, I, I answered that incorrectly. Law enforcement doesn't have to be present at a school. Law enforcement doesn't have to be present at a courtroom. Uh, in Bennington, law enforcement is there when you go through the metal detector. Yes. But, excuse me. Um, You're, you're, you're muted. Oops. I'm asking Senator Baruch to take over for a minute. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, please go ahead, Chris. Um, um, I, I guess I was, uh, we were in discussion concerning uh, the presence of law enforcement to actually enforce some of these things. Um, with schools, uh, you can't enter a school these days and just walk in. They're, they're, they're very protected structures. You have to sign in, they're, you have to go through a vestibule, you get your picture taken. It, it's, it's quite a secure environment. Um, most office buildings are, are not that way. Um, and, and again, I don't wanna get down in the weeds because some of the issues concerning buildings and essential government functions, for example, Northfield has its food uh, shelf located in the fire department, the municipal town garage. 
we have a, a clothing shelf in another muni muni municipal building. Um, we have grave concerns over exactly when a building is and isn't uh, providing an essential government service. So uh, again, we come back to the fact that if your intent, Senator, is to have a law in the books that will allow for the removal of a firearm from a location where it's not desired. Um, and frankly, I think I've demonstrated, even at Central Vermont Hospital today, some rule of law is behind those signs. And I further think that those hospitals have some security presence, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, so again, I, I maintain that, that in order for these to have some effect, you have to have law enforcement present. And that law enforcement it can be present via 3705 as easily as it could under how S30 would work. And I think the chair before he got off was responding in one way, and I know Eric Fitzpatrick will respond. Uh, the chair wants him to respond a little later. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have other points you'd like to make? Um, at this point, um, I, I have, as I've previously stated, I do have a list of concerns that I will be providing to the testimony, but frankly, for the sake of brevity and realizing that I was only going to have about 20 minutes of your precious time, I felt I should take the high road and, and ask the, the really pertinent questions about uh, why S30 in relation to 3705, and at that I can, uh, uh, I will end my testimony. Okay. And Are there I, any questions? Uh, I'll ask that in a second. I, I think it's a, it's a fair enough set of questions you pose. If in fact there are other laws that do what S30 purports to do, then I would say that's a strong argument for not passing it. Um, so we'll hear, as I said, from Eric Fitzpatrick. Questions for Chris Bradley. Senator Benning. Chris, I'm, I'm kind of curious, 3705, I think there's going to be some uh, pushback on your contention because nobody's ever tried it before that I'm aware of. But let me just think about this a second. Are you saying that if 3705 had teeth given to it, which would clearly make it a notice against trespass, uh, if in fact somebody had a sign up out front that said no guns, um, does that satisfy your concern? I, I, let me try to rephrase it because I'm, I'm only thinking about this for the first time. Your argument is that 3705 is a, a way of saying you've already got a law in the books. That's never been tested in the courts that I'm, I'm aware of. I understand where you're going with it logically. But if uh, the legislature was to say officially with an amendment to 3705, that violation of any sign that said no weapons allowed would automatically constitute a notice against trespass and therefore would be um, subjecting the individual who violates it to a liability of some kind. Is that something that you would be comfortable with? Um, generally speaking, yes, Senator. Um, I, and I guess I come back to look at Central Vermont Hospital, look at the signs within those two signs are in five feet of each other, every main entrance to Central Vermont Hospital today. And after making a couple of the calls, I believe that most, I can't claim all because I didn't make all those calls, but all major hospitals in Vermont have these signs. What well, is the rule of law behind those signs? Normally, I would be looking at this from the perspective of it's a constitutional right. I have the ability to defend myself. An impingement upon that has to be justified. What I heard from some prior witnesses left me very uncomfortable when they said somebody in a given setting should have the right to feel comfortable. Uh, to me, that's no excuse for impinging upon a constitutional right. But it seems to me there may be some middle ground to think about here if you are saying that 3705 should be the vehicle to enable a given entity to say no weapons are allowed here. 
if we change 3705 to make it very clear that there is a sign out front, if it says no weapons and you go in, you are now violating a notice against trespass. Um, and then put whatever penalty attached to it is desired. I'm, I'm only thinking this through in my head for the first time. No. I'm, I don't I'm, know where to go with it other than I, to ask if you're comfortable with that. I, I'm pleased that that seed has been planted, Senator. I, I guess as I came back to it, it still would require some law enforcement presence to address this person. And I think that's the, the difference between say your usual use of 3705, which is someone goes into a store without a shirt, the proprietor can then go say, excuse me, sir, you're supposed to have a shirt on. And if you don't put a shirt on, I'm going to ask you to leave. Um, that's the typical scenario of a 3705 use, I believe. If the person doesn't leave, law enforcement is called, law enforcement can go address that person and handle it. So. I guess I'm seeing the identity, and, and frankly, sir, I don't want to get into the one, boy, there's open carry Senator and there's concealed carry. The two are distinctly different. And well, I am not going to suggest that uh, a constitutional challenge about concealed carry um, couldn't be raised uh, concerning this. But we have certainly tread upon constitutional issues before and opted to let the courts decide. I just want to let you know, I've been in criminal law now for 37 years. I have never heard of anybody being prosecuted for not wearing a shirt at the local market uh, and were told that they couldn't come in for whatever reason. I, I, I'm not sure. Prosecution or removal, sir. I believe you well, will you find still... any number of situations oh. where people are removed. I, I'm going to, I, I think, I think it's clear to me that the folks that you represent, Chris, um, feel that this is an infringement on their constitutional rights, this, this proposed bill. Um, and I guess my question falls back as I was starting to ask is, why is it any different in a school and your response was it's more difficult to get into schools today, that's for sure. But um, I'm concerned about hospitals. I really am. I, I, that's my basic place. Where we have, um, uh, I think, it's similar to schools. Um, and hospitals usually have security. Uh, I don't don't know of any that have metal detectors or anything like that, but there are clearly signs regarding weapons. There's also signs regarding tobacco. Um, and uh, we've had cases in other states where doctors have been injured. We've had in this state hospitals where um, guns have been pulled on doctors to try to get opiates prescribed to them or given to them. So that's, that's I think it's a, um, a growing concern. And the more we ask hospitals to handle, in, particularly in emergency rooms, to handle everything from, you know, a potential heart attack to a psychiatric uh, episode, uh, all the more dangerous for staff and workers there. So I'm particularly uh, trying to understand opposition on the hospitals. I can understand concerns about um, certain government buildings. Would you respond to that? And then uh, Senator White has a comment or question. My response is, is simple, Senator. Um, we can either have a piece of paper that says something or we can actually take the investment needed to enforce what we need, what we're looking to do. Creating a piece of paper that says you can't go in here and do this or else is, is significantly different than investing in protecting, say, our state employees um, and their lives uh, by actually buying the equipment and the personnel necessary to protect that. And I guess, uh, Senators, I, I'm going to come back to, to a point I, I may have not touched upon before. Um, and that is the fact that uh, it's my understanding that there are uh, legislators that are armed today and that they go about their business at the state house um, armed. Um, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, um, 
the fact of the matter is I'm not sure, and I guess I'd be curious, do, you, do any of you have a problem with any of your fellow legislators having the means to defend themselves and possibly you in the event of, of something bad? I, I think I, I would ask the question in the opposite manner. Okay. Um, uh, in the heat of an argument, do I have a problem with a particular legislator having the ability to um, act on that with a firearm or other weapon? Any weapon? Well, um, I think I, I'm. I'd be. <clears throat> I, I think you know. I've heard stories over the years. I'm not going to repeat those stories, but in heated arguments where two people across the table in a committee room in the House, both armed, years ago. Um, uh, yeah, I'd be, I, I don't know about, you know, this whole art, I'm not going to get into this argument today, Chris, I don't want to, I, uh, it's, um, I gotta tell you, um, I'm going to continue to listen to the testimony, um, but I'm not going to get into an argument that's I'm not basically, uh, I, well, you may or may not be. I've told you my feelings about this. I'm particularly concerned about hospitals and the volatility within those hospitals. Do I think uh, legislators should be armed in the Capitol? No. Not only have a police force um, that we're spending good money on, we're going to hear from the, the Capitol Police chief shortly. Um, so, no. And I can't think of anything more tragic than a legislator getting up you know feeling threatened or something and pulling a gun on a on a witness like yourself who have we told you can't be armed i guess senator you you hit a key point it must be nice to have guards yeah it's wonderful uh, well uh, the rest of us don't and uh, and there's those guards okay. are not I, chris no, um, sorry, I, I don't I have i have too much respect for you to get into this pissing yeah. John. Oh, good. Thank you. Not, no, apologize. we are. We are. We're getting into the fishing contest, and I'm not interested in that today. I apologize. So, with all due respect, Chris, um, you know, that's what we're setting on. And so okay. I want to get Thank it. you, sir. Thank you. Thank Senator you, White. No, I think I'll leave my um, comments to. Um, to our committee discussion, because I I'm having some real, I, I realize I'm a co-sponsor on this bill, but I'm having very serious concerns about the criminal aspect of it. And um, I guess what I was going to say was that we did make it a criminal offense to have a gun at schools and in the courthouse. And maybe it shouldn't have been a criminal offense then. I don't know. But I have, I'm beginning to have um, serious concerns about creating criminal records for people. So um, that's, but I, and I, so I will just leave my, cause I don't really have a question. I, I will have some questions for Eric. Um, I don't oh. see uh, Senator Sears, uh, Senator Bruth at this point, uh, uh, I have nothing further to say. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Eric Davis. <laughs> Uh, Senator Sears, oops, he's not. Uh, he is back. Uh, Senator Sears, I uh, called Eric no. Davis, if that's all right. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Davis. Sorry, I had, I had Marley problems. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, good morning, Senators. Uh, my name is Eric Davis. I am the president of Gun Owners of Vermont. We are an all volunteer nonprofit advocacy group dedicated to the preservation of the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I would like to thank the committee for letting me speak on this bill today. Um, I have never been in front of Senate Judiciary before, so I'm, I'm a little bit nervous and I apologize in advance if I stumble over my words a little bit. Um, you know, try to bear with me here. Um, I kind of uh, see welcome, my... Eric. And I'm Dick Sears, the chair, since you've never been before us before. Uh, Senator Baruth is the vice chair. Senator Nick Gere is our clerk. Senator Benning and Senator White are long-term members of the committee. Um, and welcome to Senate Judiciary. It's nice to have you here. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And please don't be nervous. Um, we all, we all mess up. 
I'll, I'll, I'll do better once I get going here. So I'll, uh, um, I, I kind of see my job is, is trying to uh, represent um, uh, the view of, of our membership and kind of how we, uh, we see this, you know, sort of uh, legislation and give our perspective on it. Um, and, you know, whenever we're looking at gun legislation, obviously we're going to look at it, uh, you know, through the lens of uh, how it relates to the right to keep and bear arms under Article 16 and the Second Amendment. Um, but in addition to the issue of constitutionality, we, we also try to analyze things from a position of, uh, you know, practicality and, and pragmatism. And that's sort of what I want to focus on today. Um, when we take a look at anything like this, we generally kind of like to apply a sort of cost benefit ratio style of analysis to, um, you know, to these proposed restrictions um, where we weigh the cost of the restrictions on our right to keep and bear arms against the potential benefit of this law to ourselves and our communities. Um, this leads us to ask several questions. Um, the first and most obvious question is, is what are the potential benefits of this law or more directly, will this proposed law keep people safe? And I think we've uh, already been into this um, a little bit and Senator Baruth has, uh, has stated that, you know, the, the intent of this bill is not so much to um, prevent the gun from being brought into these locations as it is to provide a uh, a mechanism or a vehicle for the property owners to um, to um, have it removed from the premises, if you will. If, yes, if I could just interject there, since you're characterizing my my views, um, I would regard the bill as having two major functions. One is keeping the guns out of a building, and another is allowing someone to be removed if they entered the building with a gun. So um, I think I might have at some time have indicated that one in a certain situation was what I was concerned with, but the bill has both at heart. Certainly. Okay. I, I, yeah. I apologize if I misunderstood. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the, the, on that note, so there's, you know, the, the two roles of, of preventing the firearm and then providing a, a mechanism to, uh, you know, remove the gun and, um, you know, assess a criminal punishment to the person that brought it in there. So, um, that leads us to, you know, a, a few more questions. And, uh, you know, I, I, we like to stop and consider what exactly sort of folks it is that might bring a gun into these places in question. And the way we see it, there are two different types of people who um, would carry a firearm in these places. And the first type of person that we'll refer to as the type A person, just for the purposes of our analysis here, um, is the person who carries a firearm most often concealed for their own protection. Um, this person takes the security of themselves and their family very seriously. And this is the kind of person that wouldn't threaten anyone with their gun. You would probably not even know this person had a gun, um, but they are ready to defend themselves if necessary. Um, the second type of person or the type B person in this analysis is the person who carries a weapon for nefarious purposes and with malicious intent. This person is the aggressor and the one who would be intent on doing harm. Um, if we've already determined that the law will be largely ineffective in deterring the type B person, those who carry a weapon aggressively and with the intent of doing harm, we have to assume that any direct benefit to come from this bill has to be achieved by how it affects the type A person or the, the person that carries um, lawfully for self-defense. Um, if we look at a little closer at our type A person who carries for self-defense, we see there's all different subgroups of people who carry a gun. Um, the, the people who carry for protection, they're, they're all around you. They're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're your coworkers, um, they're store clerks, volunteer first responders, lawyers, tradespeople, business people, all, all sorts of different folks. They're young parents, they're single mothers, some of them are older retirees and disabled veterans. And there are a lot of these folks out there. 
Um, to put this in context, uh, I, I like to look at a few different numbers that to helps quantify just how many folks there are out there who might carry a gun for personal protection. Um, reports vary. However, the estimates of the total number of firearms in the United States is currently between 350 and 400 million, depending on um, which study you use. The FBI conducted a total of 39.6 million background checks through the NCIS database in 2020 alone. Um, almost 40 million background checks just in 2020. And now there's no official numbers to track how many of these were first time gun buyers. Um, however, several surveys and publications that we've dug up estimate the number of new gun owners in 2020 to be somewhere between 10 and 20 million and approximately half of those new gun owners to be women. Um, we, we think this is relevant because it, this gives a very strong indicator that people very much value their right to obtain a firearm for their own personal protection. Um, the type A people who, who acquire a gun and carry a gun, they take their safety very seriously. They're their own first line of defense against the type B aggressor. Many type A people have military, law enforcement, and first responder backgrounds. These skills, we believe, make them an asset to their communities, especially in a scenario where police or private security cannot immediately respond to the threat. Most type A people are honest and don't want to become criminals, and there's a good chance that they will disarm to comply with this law not to do so. Um, you know, as Chris touched on, a good lot of these folks, you know, will voluntarily comply with the, a property's rules about not bringing firearms on there because they, they respect that. Um, the type B person who seeks to do harm will not follow these rules at all. Um, we think that's, that's a given. So uh, we've heard a lot uh, lately about threats and civil unrest and violence and uh, sort of the, the general bad behavior of people towards one another these days. And uh, we, we think this should not be understated. Um, th this is a, a very real thing. We, we can all see what's going on around us. Um, we've certainly seen more than enough aggression and conflict over this country in the last few years, and especially in 2020. And we understand and respect everyone's desire to be protected. We believe people should be protected. Um, safety is, is a serious concern. However, we also believe that lawmakers and public servants and, and folks um, who, who enjoy, you know, working in a, build, in a building that supplies that protection or that outsources that protection, we don't think they should be the only folks who, you know, are, are afforded that, that sort of thing, um, but that the average citizen should be as well and should be able to protect themselves if they need to. It's because of that same uncertainty that the world is a dangerous place that many people make the decision to secure their own personal safety by carrying a weapon. Whether it's a gun or a can of pepper spray or some other device, an exceptionally large number of Americans have realized that the police will not always be there to keep them safe. And in fact, the courts have ruled numerous times that the police are under no legal obligation to keep them safe. These people have accepted the responsibility for their own safety and have taken steps to enhance their personal security. And these are the people that we refer to as the type A people who will be most directly affected by this law. Th these considerations lead us to the second obvious question with looking at it from this perspective, which is what are the potential costs of implementing such law or who stands to lose from all of this? Um, I think we've already begun to cover this in our analysis, but apart from our two types of people who carry uh, guns, we also, of course, have to analyze how this law will affect people who choose not to carry a gun or a weapon for personal protection, but they rely on the system to keep them safe. Um, considering, again, that the, the sort of the, the underlying theme that we've seen in this bill is that it, it kind of directly affects the folks that you don't have to worry about. Um, we argue that there's little to be gained for the folks who rely on the system to keep them safe other than the sense of security that comes from the idea of knowing that guns aren't allowed here. Um, so 
you know, the, there's that. Um, additionally, we believe that there could be a potential to increase the risk and compromise the safety of everyone involved by applying this sort of policy. By removing the ability of good people to defend themselves, we remove the deterrence for bad people to do harm. And this is why we see mass shooters overwhelmingly target areas uh, that are gun-free zones when looking to do as much harm to as many as possible. Um, that's not a coincidence. The absence of a physical means to mitigate a hostile threat will always put those threatened at a greater risk. We believe that possibly the single greatest benefit to the right to keep and bear arms is often the most overlooked and that's the deterrence factor. The killers, terrorists, extremist groups and bullies of all shapes and sizes will always prey on those first whom they know to be defenseless. Therefore, we believe it is not unreasonable to assume that this law might possibly do harm by, by um, removing folks' ability to defend themselves. Simply put, we see this bill is, is sacrificing not only individual rights, but possibly public safety as well to a false sense of security. And we like to mention all the time that Vermont has never required permission to carry a firearm, concealed or otherwise. Um, we let visitors carry guns. Um, we have never regulated that and we are consistently one of the safest states in the nation. We like to talk about that all the time too, or we're in the top three every, every single year. Um, and if we've established that S30 will likely have little or no influence on the person who carries a gun to do harm, but it criminalizes the good law abiding people, then we're, uh, you know, we, we have to conclude, I think, that this policy, it could be a net negative for everyone involved, except for potentially maybe the criminal. Um, we can't support a bill that makes it a crime for good people to peacefully possess a tool for self-defense. Um, the fact that it's been openly acknowledged that it will likely not deter those who seek to engage in aggression and violence but deters those who proactively take measures to secure the safety of themselves and their families kind of leaves us wondering um, what, what's the point? Um, if the goal is to harden security at certain locations against an existential threat, then we believe there are alternative measures that could be taken to do so. If the goal is to give property owners a mechanism to enforce their own rules, then could we possibly find a solution under an existing law or statute? And I think that's that's been talked about a, a good bit already, and I'm, I'm optimistic about that. Um, safety should be of primary importance to everyone, and we absolutely commend those who take it seriously. Uh, we're hoping that the committee will consider all options when working towards that goal and that it might be accomplished without abridging the rights of good people to defend themselves. Um, in closing, uh, that, that's uh, pretty much all I have for today, but in closing, I, I'd like to thank the committee for their time and consideration, and I know I've, I've given sort of a broad and, and big picture testimony here, but um, we, we'd also like to request that if, if we do get more into the, the specifics of this, that uh, Gun Owners of Vermont could possibly be included in those conversations as well. So, um, but uh, th that's all I, I have for today. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, Dick, you're muted. I muted myself to keep the dog uh, from disturbing the committee. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to, my thought, and we haven't talked it over in committee yet, is to provide approximately, we will not hold a public hearing. I don't think, I don't, I just don't see how I do that under Zoom, but giving your group, uh, Chris Bradley, are you still there? Chris? Yes, I am, sir. Uh, thinking about having a half an hour for gun owners of Vermont, a half an hour for Vermont Federation of Sportsmen Clubs, half an hour for um, Gun Sense Vermont. And there's another group that would get a half an hour. And you, as leaders of those 
groups would decide who you hear from, who we hear from. Um, you know, select, you know, you could do five people for 30 minutes or two people for 15 each or whatever you wanted to do. Um, in lieu of a public hearing, because I don't, under Zoom practices and talking with staff and others, it would be very difficult. So if we advance the bill, that would be my plan. And uh, so I, if that helps with your question, Eric. And Chris, I know you asked about that as well. Yes, I did. There seems to have been a precedent. And I, 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 and I, um, I don't, I, you know, my earlier comment, I want to apologize publicly to anybody who heard that comment about a contest with you, Chris. I certainly didn't intend that to be a derogatory thing to you. I just felt like you and I were getting into something that I didn't want to continue on. And uh, I, I felt that we were going to just keep hurling, and I don't intend to do that. Senator, I apologize as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and Senator Baruth, you have a question for the witness? Just a quick question for Eric. Are you replacing <coughs> Eddie Cutler? Uh, yes, sir. I, I replaced Eddie as the president of Gun Owners Vermont um, last January. Okay. I just wanted to say that was very well spoken. Uh, you do Eddie proud. Thank, thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate that. So Senator White. And then I, was, Senator I was just going to say the same thing because Eric mentioned how nervous he was and how he might stumble over his words, and he, he did not at all. You did a great job. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Senator Benning. So, yeah, you did do a great job, and don't worry about testifying in front of this group. We don't bite heads. Um, <laughs> I'm going to send this message I out. I say very you. often. I, I, not very often. Not uh, very often. Eric, I want to send this message to you and to Chris, because I'm only starting to think in a different way about this bill. Um, my initial reaction to this bill was very concerning uh, because the descriptions that I heard for advancing it uh, included statements about somebody wanting to feel safe somewhere. And when I balanced that against a constitutional right, uh, I was feeling very, um, queasy about how this was being approached, but I'm trying to figure out a, a possible method of compromise here. And, and I, I want to run this by both of you to take back and think about some. If I'm in a childcare center in downtown Guildhall, and by the way, there are no childcare centers in downtown Guildhall because there's a whole other argument about what we did in Essex County to, to child care systems, but um, if I'm opening a child care center in downtown Guildhall, I'm a good hour away from the nearest Vermont police officer. And if a private entity like that uh, wanted to have somebody there with a weapon, I would be opposed to this bill for that very reason, because it carte blanche wipes out their ability to do that. But I want you to think about conversely, does a private enterprise like that have the right to put a sign out front that says no weapons? And if we put teeth into 3705 that enabled an officer to remove someone in violation of that, um, is that something you are comfortable with? And I don't expect you to answer that right now. I, in fact, I would prefer that you had the time to just think about that because if, if I sense some way of bridging a gap, it is to be able to say that any entity, frankly, could be able to put such a sign out front. You would have the right to go there or not go there, your choice, but your exercise of a constitutional right would not override an entity's right to say, we have the right to govern what's going on inside our facility. That's a, a tough question. I'm just asking you to put that in the back of your head and roll with it for a while. I, I think that's an important conversation to be had, Senator, for sure. I think that's the conversation, particularly about hospitals, Joe. Uh, and I, I, I thank you for bringing that up, Joe. Senator Bruce. Um, two points about what 
uh, Senator Benning just said. First, S-30 wouldn't prevent the ability to have law enforcement or uh, security on the premises because there is an exemption for, um, for uh, on-duty um, law enforcement to be conducting their operations. So a school resource officer, for instance, is allowed on school property under a similar exemption. Um, so there's that. Uh, if I understand where the discussion around 3705 is going, um, I would imagine that ultimately Chris and Eric and their people would realize that what Joe is proposing is far more expansive and far more detrimental to gun owners' rights than S30. Um, in other words, if I understand what Joe is saying, he would give all private entities in Vermont the ability to put a sign out that would uh, constitute a legal trespass notice and somebody who brought a gun in then would be criminally liable. So it would make an infinite number of gun-free zones, whereas S30 is limiting it to three. Um, so I'm... I'm not stopping that conversation from going anywhere, but it, it would amaze me if gun owners of Vermont were willing to sign on to what Joe is talking about because it would give every location in Vermont the ability to declare themselves a gun-free zone with a criminal penalty for violating. That's basically why I suggested to both of them to take that and think about it. Okay. Um, I just found out that Jennifer Fitch has to leave at um, 10 o'clock. So I wonder if we would mind having Jennifer speak now and then um, I mean, maybe if Eric and Chris, do you have to go anywhere right away? No, sir. I can stick around. You're like me, you're stuck here today. Um, so if we could go to Jennifer and, and then come back to this conversation. Um, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had to leave. Go ahead, Jennifer. Jennifer you, is the new uh, commi uh, Commissioner of Buildings and General Services. Welcome to, I don't know if Senator Benning's at its confirmation hearing yet, but we're going to assume you're, <laughs> you're in good shape. So thank you for coming and welcome to the uh, Judiciary. Thank you, Senator Sears. And I certainly hope uh, Joe Benning uh, is in support of me uh, as the BGS Commissioner. Um, as you stated, my name is Jennifer Fitch. I am the BGS Commissioner. And I'm here today to specifically talk about um, S30 as it relates to BGS and our buildings. Um, my testimony today will be short. So per 29 BSA section 152, the BGS commissioner is empowered to adapt rules or adopt rules governing firearms while in state buildings. Per state facility rule number five that was established around 2000, guns are prohibited or firearms are prohibited in state buildings with the exception of law enforcement officers. This rule has been working really well for us uh, since early 2000s. And at this point, I don't feel a necessity to um, either modify the rule that currently exists or a necessity for this bill in, in terms of the purposes of BGS at this time. Well, that was pretty short. Um, <laughs> that, that's uh, why she'll be confirmed by the institutions committee. Okay. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for Jennifer? Um, have you had any problems with people, not in necessarily in the state house um, where we know there's been some issues over the years, um, particularly during the governor's, um, not this governor, but prior governors. Um, have you had any problems in other buildings? In the last four years since I've been at BGS, I am not aware of any gun incidences um, within our buildings. So any government building that's owned by the state of Vermont or leased, um, they're already prohibited. Is that correct? That is correct. Both state owned so, and leased, um, whatever buildings fall underneath the jurisdiction of BGS. Okay. Senator Baruth, you had a question. I'm, I'm just vaguely remembering an incident and now the pandemic has screwed up my, my sense of time, but I, I wanted to say it was the summer before last, or maybe it was, uh, but there was someone who was reported to have gone into one of the government buildings with a long gun. And then there was a question, they couldn't 
find uh, such a person. Are you remembering that? Yeah, that was the I am. You're talking building. about the incident at 133 that did occur. Um, yes. Your memory is correct. And in that particular incident, it, everything worked as it should have. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody was suspected of bringing a long rifle into a building. Um, you know, enforcement was notified immediately. Capitol Police was the first to respond on the scene, then shortly followed by Montpelier PD. And in that case, um, it was handled <clears throat> very well. And at the end of the day, we found that it wasn't a long gun. In fact, it was an umbrella. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. I remember a, an alert that went out or something like that. Um, that is correct. I think highlighting, what would you do if, have there been incident, if there were an incident, what, what measures would you take at a building that was not covered by security? Such as not the pavilion, but rather maybe the office of the uh, Secretary of State or So uh, as part of our as part of our program at BGS, we install uh, physical security measures inside all of our all of our state facilities, including leased and owned, as I indicated earlier. Um, the types of systems that we put in include uh, card access, right? So you have your badge, you got to swipe in. Um, it also includes cameras in some of our facilities, and it also includes panic buttons and lockdown buttons. So even when we don't have a security guard in a building or there isn't a law enforcement officer in a building, there is infrastructure that our state employees can use um, to notify local enforcement, um, lock the building down, utilize the panic button, um, those types of things. So we have all of those measures in our buildings. Senator Benning, then Senator White. So Jennifer, with respect to government buildings and this bill's covering of government buildings, do I hear you correctly that you're saying it's not necessary? It's not necessary for us at BGS, that is correct, because we already have, um, pursuant to 29 BSA section 152, I already can uh, govern guns in my, in my state facilities. Thank you. Senator White. So if, if that umbrella had in fact turned out to be a long gun, that you were still at, you were still doing the the same thing. And just because if we had passed this bill, that wouldn't have prohibited the person from entering with his gun any more than your signs. So I, I'm just- um, Well, because of the prohibition, right? It allows yeah. us to take action immediately. So, right. so I guess I have what I need at BGS yep. to, to regulate guns within my state facilities. Therefore, I don't find this bill to be a necessity to BGS. Good, yep, that was. Um, Senator Baruth, and then I have one question. Hopefully we can get you out of here by 10. This is not so much a question for uh, Ms. Fitch, but um, I, I understand that there are lawmakers who carry within the state house. Um, and I've heard that for years. And I've also heard that at least one of those persons argues that the, the posted rule does not contravene uh, his right to carry a, a firearm. So I think part of the intent of S30 is to stiffen the, um, the authority behind the rules that um, the commissioner is pointing to. I agree having rules in place can work, um, but if it runs up against uh, a person or a movement that declares that only state law um, contravenes their right, then I think it does give us an additional authority at that point. But I, I take the commissioner's testimony uh, and uh, we'll leave it at that. I'd like to leave you with one thought, commissioner, as well as Senator Benning to look at. And that is the disparity in state office buildings. And I'll use Bennington as an example. The Bennington State Office Building has sheriffs. If you enter the um, foyer to go either to a courtroom or any office with one exception in that building, whether it be Department of Labor, Department of Children and Families, or the courts. So you've gone through a metal detector and everything. You get into probation and parole, you don't go through any of those. You have to go through your normal security that you have. 
but there have been assaults of staff at probation and parole. And it's a complaint that I've heard from state, uh, other state employees in other parts of the state where there isn't the same level of security in some as others. So I hope that the institutions committee and, and you're as the new commissioner will take a look at that problem. Um, it seems to be a disparity in that many state office employees have noted that. It may have nothing to do with this bill, but it is a concern. Thank you. Thank I think you we very have much. You out of here. I think we have you out of here at 10. Um, where we, yeah, thank you. We, where we still, um, have we finished with Mr. Davis? I think we have. Yeah. Eric, thank you for your testimony. Um, you're welcome to hang here in the in the meeting and, and uh, listen to Commissioner Sherling, who's our next witness of the Department of Public Safety. Mike, good to have you with us. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think thank you uh, for making time. I know you're clad out with various things. It's a little brisk. Um, I think I will also be uh, probably as brief as Commissioner Fitch. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of uh, Public Safety. Um, uh, we're here to provide any requisite background the committee might need. Uh, I think Commissioner Fitch touched on a couple of the key points. There are no known uh, incidents in, in state buildings uh, involving firearms in recent history. Um, she touched on their, um, their regulatory uh, posture, uh, and I think other witnesses have touched on some of the other tools that are used in uh, circumstances where uh, property owners have opted to um, post and prohibit firearms on, on premise under existing statutes. Um, I would, of course, note for the record, uh, the recent um, uptick in threats to government buildings is pretty widely publicized. So that's a piece of background information for the uh, committee to certainly consider. Um, I would also note that the prohibition itself, uh, if you're looking to achieve security at any given location, um, the prohibition itself is a piece of a larger fabric um, of security precautions, uh, some of which uh, the, the commissioner mentioned are in place at, state, at some state buildings, um, screening tools, um, and then you know, ultimately what, uh, you know, what the, the back end uh, looks like if someone's found to have um, a prohibited item, whether that's a firearm or, or something else. Um, those are really the, the key considerations from our perspective. Um, we don't have a particular position um, on this bill that um, we've developed. Um, I would note uh, one last thing, which is sort of tangential and note that the, the bill is crafted as a potential new misdemeanor. Uh, there are limited options in terms of what law enforcement can do with uh, witnessed misdemeanors, given the evolution of the rules of arrest, rule three in particular that the legislature has undertaken in recent years. Um, so the you know, the, the tool set available, even if this were to become a new crime, um, is relatively limited. Could I, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, could I just ask for a clarification? I, I wasn't sure at the end, you referenced, uh, Commissioner, uh, a rule or a law that I'm not familiar with. What, if you could just unpack that last part a little bit? Certainly, the Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure, specifically Rule 3, uh, outlines when a, a physical arrest, uh, custody of a person uh, can occur uh, subsequent to a probable cause existing for a particular violation. The circumstances under which law enforcement can take physical custody of a person versus releasing them on a citation to appear at a later date are severely constrained by Rule 3. So... That's something that uh, you'd have to take a look at um, if you were to go down the road of creating a new misdemeanor and wanting to actually um, you know, physically uh, incapacitate someone who might uh, be posing a perceived threat as a result of a violation of, of uh, S30. Um, you, there 
inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to say uh, also, I really appreciated your approach uh, during the um, recent, you know, alert that state capitals were under. I felt like we were all very well briefed. Uh, I felt personally the situation was very much in hand. So um, just hats off to your department. Uh, thank you. If I might, before, I see Senator White has a question, but for Eric Fitzpatrick. Eric, when we get to committee discussion, can you do a little research on what uh, Commissioner Sherling just spoke about in terms of rule three and the ability to enforce a minor misdemeanor, which I believe this is a year maximum sentence um, and it is considered a misdemeanor. So what is, I'm assuming that an officer could tell the person to leave the building, but what else could one do? So if you could look at that as well, Eric, please. Sure, we will do. I think if it's witnessed, it's okay, but I'll follow up on that. If it's witnessed, it can be arrest. Yes. Okay. Would you follow up on that, please? And yep. uh, Senator White, you had a question, then Senator Benning. Well, I was just going to ask, Commissioner, um, is, is that it? Does Rule Three only apply to misdemeanors? Because surely, if if um, somebody is presenting a threat. Um, an obvious threat with their with their fire. I mean, there would be a difference between um, just having the firearm and presenting uh, some kind of a threat. That, that, that so does Rule Three only apply to misdemeanors or when there isn't a, an active threat? No, it applies to everything, uh, Senator. And um, the. Uh, Ledge Council is accurate. The a witnessed um, misdemeanor has greater latitude, but um, what, I think what we're envisioning uh, will typically happen is, uh, you know, unless someone is an active shooter and forcing their way in, which you have a whole different problem right. at that point, um, they're going to be turned away at the door or they might step inside and then be removed. And then when law enforcement arrives, um, it is no longer a witness to misdemeanor uh, occurred prior to their arrival. So it, in the event you've got fragments of information that indicate that the person was trying to gain access and has some underlying criminogenic or mental health or other issue, um, the constraints on further action are significant. Thanks. Am, am I correct that, that in terms of state buildings, there already is a rule in effect. And so unless the person is exhibiting behavior that would indicate that they're a threat to occupants of that building, they, they're already not allowed to carry firearms. In the state. That's correct. And that's uh, the rule that Commissioner Fitch was talking about. So the way that uh, uh, an enforcement action might play out uh, is a, a person's prohibited. They choose to go inside with a firearm. Uh, they're asked to leave. They refuse to leave. It becomes a trespass under 3705. Thank you. Senator Benning and then Senator White again. Commissioner, you've been in law enforcement for a long time. Have you ever actually cited someone for that <clears throat> very series of events? Not that I can recall. Um, there certainly have been a myriad of trespass cases, as you can attest, Senator, on a variety of different topics um, and refusals to leave premises. Uh, I don't recall one that's related to a firearm in the, in the cross section of uh, events that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, like Senator Baruth indicated, COVID has not only bent time, but reality and, and memory in many ways. How many years have you been in law enforcement now? 31. Okay. On and off. I had a hiatus there in commerce, which I enjoyed very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Senator Bucky. So, um, I just, if, uh, let me get this straight. So somebody comes in, they're carrying a gun in a state building where it's posted, and there's a rule against it. They refuse to 
um, leave, then you can cite them under 3705. So would that not be also true for a non-government building that a hospital, for example, that had their rule about not carrying a gun in there and somebody came in and they refused to leave, could they also not be cited under 3705? They could, Senator. That that rubric exists for um, it, anyone who's lawfully asked to leave uh, any premises. Okay, thank you, Senator Baruth. I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm remembering the opinion that Eric issued the committee, and I believe it was a contrary opinion to what what we're hearing. So I, I know that the chair wants to save that for the end, but um, I, I think we're running the risk of not being able to question the witnesses with regard to that opinion. Um, so I just, I just note that. I'm not familiar with that opinion, Senator, so I can't. No, no, it was, it was issued just, just to the committee. Um, because you're gonna be taking over the committee in three minutes. While I go to help them out there, uh, we have one other witness before the 1030 break, and that's uh, Chief Romy, but you're welcome, Senator. Romy I. Romy I. I'm going to, um, I stand corrected, Senator White. Thank you for <laughs> your, um, Commissioner Sherling, thank you for your, um, oh my God, he's at a beach in the <laughs> Caribbean with a palm tree. Um, behind him. I'm already jealous. Looks like a beautiful day uh, out there. Chief Romy. Uh, so uh, you're taking over, Senator Baruth. Thank you very much. I'll be back. Uh, Thank you. Have a good day. As soon as I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chief Romy, I welcome. Good, good morning, um, Senators and other uh, chair. <laughs> Treasured guests, um, Matthew Romy, I Capitol Police Chief, and the first thing I'd like to do, and unfortunately they're gone already, but I would like to uh, thank uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety for breaking the bad news to you about Rule 3. Um, he probably explained it much better than I can. Um, I'm still um, adjusting to the idiosyncrasies of uh, Vermont procedure. Uh, even though, believe it or not, I've been up here for almost four years now um, as your police chief. Um, I have given Peggy um, uh, and Senator Sears a, a memorandum that uh, I won't drag you all through because I think that for the most part, many of those things have been um, addressed already today. But I did explain just for clarity how the Capitol Police functions in the sphere um, of dealing with firearms. I would like to note that um, no one currently in the Capitol Police Department or the Sergeant at Arms Office is uh, aware of a carriage of weapons in the building incident, if you will. Um, there's been uh, the rumor mill swirls um, and I've heard them, um, other officers have heard them, but we have not had any incidents since I've been there with members at all. Uh, and we know for sure that uh, even uh, Sergeant Manning is the longest uh, currently serving Capitol Police officer, and he is not aware of, of any in the history of the Capitol Police Department. So that goes back to, to 99. Um, we in this kind of world, we, well, really in everything we do, we work through a, a lens of First Amendment protections. So we have to look at any enforcement action that we take in the Capitol Police Department, whether it's in the State House, um, on the lawn, in another uh, state building. We have to make sure that we uh, steer clear of any First Amendment grounds. Um, there is an outline in that, uh, in that memo about some of the relevant uh, statutes and rules. Uh, because it is different. We have rules in the state house, which are different than rules in other state buildings, different than rules uh, and a law in the Supreme Court building that prevents the carriage of firearms. And then we have a, a 
a couple of sets of rules actually that govern the lawn. And so we deal with weapons in each of those different places, or we um, we would deal with weapons in each of those places somewhat differently. Uh, Senator Bruce, you were correct. The first thing that we would always do with someone, as long as they're capable of de-escalation and um, conversation, we would uh, we would certainly try to reason with them. I think that's something that we want to do uh, with anyone that we can. Uh, but if we were alerted to someone carrying a firearm in the building, we would uh, ask them if they are. We would make sure they're not law enforcement there on a uh, on an official uh, visit and uh, you know, if they're not, we would we would ask them to take, to take it back out to their car and lock it up, secure it, and come on back in and enjoy the rest of the day. Um, there are many state houses. I, I sort of anticipated a question regarding this. There are many state houses across the country where the carriage of concealed weapons by citizens is permitted within the building. There are some rules and some procedures that govern that. Uh, for instance, the Florida State House, uh, which has four separate law enforcement agencies working within it. Um, if you present your concealed carry permit from the state of Florida or from another state that Florida recognizes to the screening station, they hand you a card about where you can and cannot take it and what you can and cannot do with it in the building and what you're responsible for, and they, they welcome you to the Florida Capitol. Um, caveat to that that's how it was 18 months ago when we visited um i don't believe anything's changed uh down there but there are several state houses that do uh permit that um when we go into other state buildings uh there's a tri-branch mou that um kind of negotiates procedures within the capitol complex when uh we are conveyed the authority to enforce bgs rules um, in BGS buildings and on the grounds. When we go into those grounds, we, absent an active violent situation, we defer to BGS or their representative, which is usually in the form of uh, BGS security. And if they want the person uh, removed from the building, we'll have them instruct them to leave. And if they don't, then we're back to a, a 3705 trespass arrest. Um, same thing for the Supreme Court. We are over there fairly routinely to assist judicial security with issues that they may have going on. Uh, there is a particular state law, uh, 13 VSA 4016, that prohibits the carriage of firearms in the courts, and um, we would certainly uh, make an arrest on that if, if we needed to. Um, the lawn is an interesting um, conundrum for us. Uh, it is a First Amendment sanctuary place, if you will. It is, uh, it is, it is, it is holy ground cons considering the First Amendment. And the rules are actually um, ratcheted back in that place where there is not a prohibition against carrying firearms. There's a discouragement. And that discouragement is in the set of rules that BGS sends out the people that booked the lawn. Our practice has been, um, and this was uh, something we took from Montpelier Police that seemed to work well for them out there. Um, if we see someone, you know, carrying a long gun slung across their back, we uh, approach them, engage with them. Uh, we're usually able to break down the barriers pretty quick. We encourage them to take it and secure it in their car. And if they are adamantly uh, intent on uh, exercising their rights, we give them uh, some do's and don'ts, and we explain to them what will get them um, you know, sideways with us, uh, namely that slung weapon coming off their shoulder. Um, there is a current state statute, and this is one of those um, additional things that um, that you may wish to consider with this of aiming a gun at another. It is um yeah, the first the first offense fine is fifty dollars. Um and if you discharge really? it if it's you, if you aim a gun at someone it's fifty dollars? Any person it's uh thirteen VSA forty eleven, 
any person intentionally point or aim a gun, pistol, or other firearm, except in self-defense and the lawful, or the lawful discharge of duty, fine not exceeding $50. And if you discharge it, um, punished by imprisonment for not more than one year, fine more than $100. I would submit that if you discharge a firearm at another person, that's not the statute that I would look to charge you with. It would right. be an attempted murder. Um just, but you know, it's 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 interesting. Um, sometimes finding some of these statutes, um, I don't actually. It doesn't have a a note in there about when that that statute was passed. I suspect it might be a little older. There is a, a another statute that may apply with these things with uh, the conversation you're currently having, and that's the carrying dangerous weapons. It would require us to improve and approve, excuse me, it would require us to prove intent to harm. Um, and that's a two year felony. Um, if the person intends to injure multiple persons, such as uh, in a mass shooting or something, it's a felony punishable by not more than 10 years or $25,000. So there is, um, there are some other things we can apply to the, to these situations uh, should, um, should we need to? One interesting thing that I did want to bring to the committee's attention, and again, in my memo, I'll tell you the Capitol Police uh, take no position on this bill. Um, we rarely take a position on any legislation, but we want you to understand how it would affect uh, us in the operation uh, of the State House and, and the greater Capitol complex. One thing that I know Senator Benning is uh, dreading is the conversation concerning screening in this in the state house. And one of the things that legislative councils previously identified to me as a barrier to screening in not only the state house but in government buildings that are not a courthouse or part courthouse is that it's not illegal to carry a weapon in the building. So we can't actually search you for things that aren't illegal. And, you know, in a fundamental way, I, I understand that. So this bill is drafted right now, I believe, and I, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm not a lawyer and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So uh, please take your legal guidance from others. Um, but I believe that, that this would probably lower that barrier to us implementing a screening program at the State House. I will follow that up immediately by telling you that that is by far not the only barrier, but it appears to be the only uh, legal barrier uh, for us to screen in the building. Um, there is a, a modification that uh, begins on line 13, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't put the page number, but I think it's – I, I want to say it, it may be one of the first modifications, but uh, it's the – the line that says it's currently in use for the performance of essential government functions. And I would just ask you to think for a moment that if we were to implement a screening program at the state house, which again, not saying we should or we shouldn't, it's a discussion for another day, um, we probably couldn't screen during farmer's night because that's not an essential government function or it would still be going on through the pandemic is kind of my, my train of thought with this, right? So if we don't screen when people are coming in during farmer's night and the way our building is constructed, they could come in and secrete anything, uh, not secrete, secret, I apologize, um, something in the building for use later. So it would minimize the effectiveness of that screening program. Uh, Chief, if uh, I could just yes. ask, sure. when, uh, when we were in the building and particularly when there was a state of a state address, uh, there was screening, or, or I'm remembering wrong, and yet you seem to be saying that you couldn't do screening. How, how does it work on that day? So we don't screen on that day. We do bag checks. and um, So you mean a metal have... detector kind of thing? Correct. We do okay. bag checks, and we have deputies at the doors, um, to discourage um, the entry with unauthorized things. Um, for instance, last year uh, during the State of the State that was interrupted, um, 
by the by the protest. It, quite frankly, it, it shows how a screening program would be beneficial in some cases because we were able to prevent that group from bringing in uh, pots and pans that they were intending on using for their uh, their disruption. So. Um, much like a lot of things that we talk about, uh, the, it, things like screening programs have a butterfly effect. Um, and we see that a couple of days out of the year, but, you know, we take the extraordinary step of doing bag checks and having those deputies on the doors during, uh, those large events because of the enormous risk that we take by having the entire the entirety of government in one place, which is a um, a, a huge risk. Mm-hmm. Um, one other thing I, I would like to mention: there's a modification um, about, or the there's the exemption that applies to legitimate law enforcement purposes, whether the officer is on or off duty. And it seems to me to co- sort of contradict itself because mm-hmm. I. Uh, wouldn't want an officer doing uh, legitimate law enforcement uh, purposes off-duty. However, one of the interesting things that this brings up is a, a problem that we have seen with the uh, the guns on school property and the guns in uh, schools statute. And that particular, I'm trying to bring it back up for some reason. I can't seem to find it. I have that tab somewhere. Um, yep, possession of a dangerous weapon in the school bus or on the school building or on school property. And that already prohibits the carriage of firearms on school property. And it does not apply to the exemption in there is a law enforcement officer while engaged in law enforcement duties. And basically what that means is that I violate that statute twice a day. When I drop my children off, at school and when I pick them up in the afternoon because I'm not engaged in official law enforcement duties while I'm doing that. However, um, I, we have taken the stance that um, you would absolutely want me to be armed and prepared to react should something happen in that school while I'm on my way to work or home or while I'm dropping them off or picking them up. So I think that's a um, an unfortunate uh, exemption uh, over in that statute. And I I would certainly like to see that exemption in this statute, um, you know, kind of cleared up to help us through that. Uh, An interesting thing, when you look at the federal gun free school zones act um, in the, in the U S code is it does not apply to persons carrying a, uh, with persons possessing a concealed carry permit. So, for instance, when I lived in Alabama, my wife had a concealed carry permit from Alabama. So that federal gun-free school zones act exempted her from the restriction against carrying on school property when she dropped the kids off or picked them up. So there was a nod towards that permitting process, um, or and it um, would also exempt, of course, law enforcement. Um, the last thing I, I guess I'll just mention is that, you know, without, and this kind of goes back to what the commissioner of public safety said, um, we can pass the stat or you could pass the statute. I say we, the Royal, we Vermont could have the statute, but it's not going to change the safety of the occupants absent a comprehensive full-time screening program. Um, it, you know, we are, strictly reactive in the state house right now we we don't have anything that um would prevent you from coming in there we're also not alone in that there's six or seven it's what it kind of changes a little bit every year state houses across the country that don't have any screening methods um we can take a long dive down the road of what it may be appropriate for us or may be inappropriate for us but um without a a comprehensive screening program a a bill such as as this is almost like an add-on charge, much like the seatbelt law. You know, I've stopped you for speeding, but I'm going to add a secondary violation uh, of a seatbelt act. So this would be one that, with very few exceptions, I don't think would be applied, except in the case of we we have something else going on. Oh, and we're going to add this one on as as well. Um, 
Alabama, right before I I left, and I say right before I left, I, um, it was 20, they did it in 2015, and they came back and amended it in 2018. They actually passed a Prohibited Places Act such as this, and I found that statute very interesting um, from a, a citizen standpoint as well as a uh, professional standpoint. And one of the things I found interesting about it was that, um, as you were saying, uh, the price chopper down the street can decide that it doesn't want me to shop there with a firearm. And it's my decision whether or not I uh, carry in there or not. The, um, the interesting thing that they did down there was that if you had a concealed carry permit, a place of public access like a grocery store or a gas station, those kind of things, um, could not prohibit you from carrying on their property unless they posted the doors and had a screening program in place. And it seemed to me as a citizen with that, it seemed to me that if they're taking away, for instance, I think of my wife a lot. Um, she reminds me to think of her if I fail to think of her. Um, is that if you're going to take away her right of self-defense, you have to protect her when she's there. They included some interesting things in there about if you're an employer, you can't uh, prohibit firearms and personal vehicles on your property because the, your employees have a right to defend themselves between work and home. So I found those interesting. And, you know, again, I'm not saying that y'all should do anything like that. Um, I just think it's interesting uh, within the discussion process. I, I just, before I turn it back over to Senator Sears, I just wanted to respond to the on or off duty. Um, I agree that should be looked at that piece. Personally, um, one of the things that I find most troubling about what happened at the Capitol was as they begin to charge these people, there are, I think, 400 active cases. It's turning out that many of them are off duty police officers, um, retired military active duty military. Um, and that's within the group that were the most coordinated and violent um, at, the, at the US Capitol. So I, I think sometimes people think of off-duty police officers and you, you cited yourself as somebody who should be allowed to uh, use their weapon in case uh, they are at a school and something happens. But I would, I would just caution us there's there's growing evidence of radicalization in police forces, military, National Guard, et cetera. And so any provision that would allow those people to carry off duty seems to me to be uh, um, really asking for trouble these days. Senator Sears. Yes, no, I, I'm. I would prefer to have Senator Baruch continue. I'm okay. sorry I missed most of your testimony, and then oh. when the committee's finished with chief, with the chief, I'll take. Okay, it. I know we're we're hard on a break, but <clears throat> Senator White. So I just wanted to ask the uh, chief about that about the off duty and on duty because um, if if it if we don't allow it for off duty, then your contention. I, th I thought I misheard, I either misheard you or I misunderstood you, that when you drop your kids off, you're off duty, and yet you are carrying, so you would, you would be in violation of, of that. So I, is, am, is that in conflict with what Senator Baruth just said about removing the off duty, because um, you're not on duty when you're dropping your kids off? Well, you know, I think globally we have, um, we've looked at our law enforcement officers and to Senator Bruce's point, yes, there were a few law enforcement officers and military members that took part in the, um, the uh, January 6th uh, invasion of the U.S. Capitol. I would temper you, uh, your view of that to look at the, raw numbers in comparison to the numbers of law enforcement officers across America. Um, I, I'm not even sure what our current uh, population of law enforcement officers is, but 
you know, just like there's um, there's bad teachers and bad politicians and uh, bad high school students, there's a there's going to be a few bad cops out there. Um, the numbers just don't allow there not to be. I think the overwhelming majority of law enforcement, especially here in Vermont, um, are stand up, good quality people. And um, I, you know, I, I just, uh, I think about the the density of law enforcement in Vermont, and to Senator Bending's point about places being an hour or more away from the 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 nearest on duty police officer. We just do not have the density of law enforcement officers here on duty at any one time, and we rely so much on the ability and the and the willingness of our law enforcement officers to respond to things when they're not on duty. Um, I know our department takes a stance that um, you know, unless you are intoxicated or otherwise unable to discharge your duties, we consider you to be a sworn law enforcement officer and uh, support your ability to carry uh, your weapon. Well, There's we, a, a, if I could, if I could just cut in, we've had this discussion many times in Senate education, um, and people have advanced the argument unsuccessfully that off-duty police officers should be allowed to, if if they are uh, on school grounds, in effect act as a resource officer, and I. I have to say, I think it's, it's uh, in other words, if they perceive trouble, they should be allowed to go in with their firearm. And I personally, I've always opposed that because I've never written a, a gun safety bill that didn't have an exemption for active duty or on duty, because I think that's important. But um, there was a push some years back to allow retired or off duty to carry on school grounds and I think that would be, in effect, just getting rid of the prohibition on weapons. So um, I, I, I know we're supposed to. One second, I just want to ask the chair, um, Mr. Chair. So we're ten minutes past our break time. Yeah. I, I don't want to cut into the other witnesses. Um, what would you like to do? I'd like to have a. Oops! I just. I'm, oh God! I just. I'm, I just messed up. Back to full screen. Um, I would like to have a full discussion in committee and if there's continued questions for uh, Chief Romy. Did I get it right? Uh, no, Romy I. Romy I. Romy I. I will. Like uh, Romeo. I'm sure we can get him back from his tropical uh, vacation to continue the discussion. I think we need further committee discussion on this bill. A number of issues have come up that lead me to, um, I could not support the bill as currently constituted given some of the testimony I've heard and some of the concerns, but I, I remain concerned about people carrying weapons in places where um, they might so I'd like to continue the committee discussion here, our testimony that we've set up and then <clears throat> get to the heart of some of these issues, Rule 30 with Eric and 30, is it 3705, I'm better understanding some of these things and having a, a full discussion with the committee. But, um, Senator White. Can I just respond to something that Philip, just Senator Berth just said about um, the schools and I understand if you want to have the discussion about schools, but my understanding of law enforcement officers in Vermont is that when they're sworn as a level three officer, they're assumed to be capable of responding to something, whether they are on or off duty. So if you're in bed in the middle of the night and there's um, murder happening down the street from you and you're called, you're, my understanding is that that is a... Um, a duty of sworn law enforcement officers in Vermont. And I might be wrong, but I will check that out if, just to make sure because- If you're um, called, whether, then, then you're on. What? I, I was gonna say, if you're called to the scene, then you're on duty. Well, if you're, um, well, I, I think that there are some well, a nuances I, I in there, I, but yeah. we'll- I'm gonna say that uh, I think the witnesses today have brought up some issues with the effort. Um, 
that weren't there uh, when we dealt with schools way back when, but we look at school security today. Um, when we first said that you can't carry uh, a firearm into a school or into a courtroom, times have changed and looking at this bill, and I think that to give due deference, I wanna hear from the League of Cities and Towns and the other witnesses we have left for today and then do some serious committee discussion. And as I said, also have opportunity for the four, four groups to provide some testimony to the committee on um, ideas. Senator Benning. Just so you know, Senator Sears, um, Matt Delario has been listening to this conversation, with, especially with respect to the law enforcement officers' descriptions of some of the rules in criminal procedure. Um, he's sent me an email. I've copied you all with that. If the continuing conversation leads us to go down that path, he would like an opportunity to talk about it. Okay. Um, with that, why don't we take a break until about five minutes of 11 and we'll pick up with um, uh, get the right one Devin Green and Karen Horn and Kagan Mays Williams. Great. Can everybody mute and shut your video off, please? Yeah, Thank before you. we before I do, Peggy, can I talk with you briefly? Yep. Uh, we're on YouTube. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't care who. Okay, I yep, mean, of it's course. Not a, it's not a big secret. I just want to give you some idea what I was looking at for an agenda item. Yeah, of course. Um, when I talked about DCF, I, I would like a, I'm going to call it a round table discussion about aggressive behavior with juveniles in the juvenile justice system. Um, and uh, I start with having DCF uh, Department of Mental Health, Department of Aging and Independent Living, um, John Campbell, Marshall Paul, uh, somebody from Beckett and somebody from Seal. Um, from from that, where? What was the Seattle, last one? Depot Street. What's it called? 204 Depot. Oh, Seattle, I don't know that one. Jim Henry. Jim Henry. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, just have a kind of a round table, table discussion, call it a round table discussion. I don't know if we get a round table, but um, given the aggressive behavior of some of the, the um, that has become a danger to staff as well as residents of um, the staff, not just inside programs. We had that case in the hotel that they described yesterday be a discussion about some of the aggressive behaviors that they're seeing with juveniles and how to deal with them. And when do you want this to happen? Well, you know, I don't know how, how our agenda is for next week, but as we look at the agenda for next week, next week would be okay or the following week. So during an during a committee meeting time, right? Yeah, I, yep. I, I, I say two hours. Okay. You know, so like when... a nine to 11 or something on, or 10 to 12 on a Tuesday or whatever. Okay, so my guess will be the week after, but let me let me see if I can fit in what you want for next week, and then we'll okay. the week after. Okay. All right. Sounds uh, good. I'll see you in five minutes. In ten minutes. <laughs> ten. Oh, okay. Yep, ten minutes. I'm sorry. Oh. I thought we. Okay. Sounds good. I guess we can get back to our committee meeting on S30, and uh, are we ready to get going, Peggy? Our first witness is Devin Green yep. from the Vermont Hospital Associate. Yep. Vermont you Association. Are. She can tell us who she represents. <laughs> yes. Good morning, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. We represent all of Vermont's hospitals and they are all nonprofit and mission-based entities. Thank you for having me in today to testify on S30. I will say when I was preparing for this testimony, I was taken back to the fall of 2017 when I received an emergency email that there was an active shooter at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and that uh, patients would have to be diverted to other hospitals. 
Um, a couple weeks after that, I talked to one of the ICU nurses who had been there during the shooting, and she was clearly traumatized by the event. Um, now, this is an ICU nurse, so she's seen a lot of things, but this, this really shook her. So with that, um, Vaz is happy to support S30. Uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, because knowing that what happened at Dartmouth-Hitchcock could easily happen across the river in Vermont, uh, we want to support this. It allows patients, visitors, and healthcare workers to secure their firearms in their car with uh, less chance of conflict for the people who are working at the hospitals. It's hard to ask someone to put their firearm away um, when you're working at the hospital. And this will give uh, hospital workers something to point to that's in the law. Uh, earlier, Eric Davis testified that there are two different types of people carrying weapons, law abiding and those with criminal intent. I would say that in a hospital situation, there's another individual you need to consider, which is the individual who is in, alt in an altered mental state. Um, this could be either through psychosis or use of substances. We have a lot of hospital workers who have seen <clears throat> individuals in an altered mental state grab for a weapon from a law enforcement officer. Now, a law enforcement officer knows what to do in that situation, but a regular law-abiding citizen carrying a weapon may not know what to do. And so we think that that could create a danger for patients and the loved ones in the hospital who are already in an incredibly vulnerable situation. Um, S30 would also help protect healthcare workers. Um, as an emotionally charged environment, hospitals hold a high risk of injury to healthcare workers. In 2018, according to US Bureau of Labor Statistics, healthcare workers comprise 73% 73 of all non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses due to violence. So that's 73% of all the injuries that were non-fatal were put upon healthcare workers. Uh, this law would help ensure, now it wouldn't protect those healthcare workers from injury, but it would help ensure that those injuries are not lethal um, and due to firearms. S30 will also protect lives outside of the hospital. Um, as the Dartmouth-Hitchcock shooting showed, the repercussions do not end at one hospital. If a hospital goes into lockdown, patients must be diverted to other hospitals in the area. And in emergency situations, those extra minutes could be the difference between life and death. Please consider voting in favor of S30, and I thank you for your consideration. I have a couple of questions, Devin, and I appreciate your being here this morning. Um, uh, first is, uh, are all hospitals in favor of this bill, or do we have yes. emergency use? So there, uh, every hospital in the state is, is supportive of this bill. Yes. Secondly, um, have we, <clears throat> you know, I, I was amazed at how I had to try to get to into the, inside the Rutland Hospital what I had to go through for an appointment in one of the medical offices there. Um, and now that we're having screening uh, for um, people going into any uh, hospital, you know, they're taking the temperature and all that, and fairly automatic unless it's a real emergency. I've been able to go right into the emergency room. I think people are able to get in a little easier. Um, I'm wondering what, there seems to always be security now at the front doors of our hospitals. Um, and that was one of the issues Mr. Davis brought up in, in earlier uh, in his testimony about having that and people feeling the need to be able to defend themselves uh, and why they carry. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, there is security at hospitals, um, and I can, I, at most, if not all hospitals at this point, um, there is security there. Um, so I would say that that does go to what was brought up earlier in the testimony. 
Um, what about, I, I believe, I hope I didn't dream it, but I believe there was a, a, a hospital in Vermont that, where I heard, heard from them that a patient who had a gun was using that gun in a way at this hospital to try to procure opiates. Is that an actual incident or did that was that something that somebody made up? Do you know? I do not know. I definitely have heard incidents of patients reaching for guns for law, from law enforcement officers. I've heard from several chief medical officers about those incidents. I have not heard about that one. Okay. Senator White. Thanks, Devin. Um, so do you feel, do the hospitals feel that they have no other ability to do this? Because one of the things we've been hearing is that um, if you put up a sign that says no weapons allowed and um, somebody is confronted and asked to get rid of their weapon, they may do it or they may refuse to do it. And if they refuse to do it, that it can constitute a legal, um, an illegal trespass under 3705. So I'm curious as to why the hospitals would not use that um, to uh, get people off the premises if they had a gun. So I, first of all, I'm not sure if they all know that that is what they, I think they all have policies to not have weapons in their, um, in their hospitals. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that it would just be much easier to point and less conflict to point to a law and say, this is, this mm -hmm. is something that the state is imposing as opposed to what the hospital is trying to do. I think with the hospital, people are coming in um, for illnesses, it gets emotionally charged, um, staff is stretched thin. And so this would provide greater protection um, than having to, uh, it, it may lessen the conflict to be able to point to this instead of just a policy. No. But the policy could be backed up with that other law. So, but if you gave some teeth to it, I mean, right now, it, I, I agree with Senator Benning, it would need more teeth. Um, but it, it, we would not be, we would not necessarily uh, be opposed to that proposal either. Thanks. Senator Sears? Yes, Senator Benning. Devin, do all hospitals in Vermont? now have a sign out front that says no weapons? I don't know. I can check on that. I'd like to know. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know my hospital has a sign saying no weapons and no uh, tobacco. So uh, it may say this is a tobacco-free campus. And I'm, I'm not sure which. And, and actually, Devin, if I can follow up. Uh, I'm assuming you also uh, have supervision over entities like here in my neck of the woods, Corner Medical, which is a, a smaller size facility, not a hospital. Um, and if you do, I'd like to know whether there are similar signs out front of them as well. I may not, but I can, I don't know if that entity is hospital affiliated. If it is, I can check on that. If not, I can work with VMS to try to get that, the Vermont Medical Society to try to get that information. I, I know this one is associated with NVRH. I'm assuming okay. Concord, the Concord facility is the same way, but I'd like to know whatever you can find out. Thanks. Okay. Other questions, uh, Senator Baruth. Uh, not a question, although I thank Devin for being here. Um, I would just say that if you look at the masking debate, I guess I would have to call it, um, there, there are a large number of people in Vermont and nationally who believe that it's unconstitutional for them to be told to wear a mask. And so we see... Um, you know, we see ongoing friction 
violence in certain areas over this. And there is no amendment of, of the Constitution that protects against mask wearing. So when we're talking about firearms, we're talking about a group of gun owners who very fervently believe that their constitutional right will overcome uh, a hospital's policy or a store's policy. Um, and so just to reiterate, one of the things we're trying to do is say to those people, this is not an administrative rule. This is uh, in statute that this location like courthouses and schools, you, you cannot carry a weapon. And that way we take it out of the realm of, uh, you know, a policy passed by a private organization and we elevate it to something that's clearly understood to be in the law. Um, so I, I take the point that Senator White and Senator Benning and others have been making about that, that there may be ways in which these rules could connect to existing statute. I think that's an important discussion for us to have. But just, just to be clear, what the bill tries to do is say, it's important to let people know that it's against the law to carry in these areas because as Senator Sears pointed out, there's not only the opiate epidemic as a flashpoint, the, the addictive power of opiates and people needing to have them, but there's also now the anti-masking thing as well as uh, I would argue the, the kind of radicalization of the open carry movement. So there's a lot of things at once that are converging on these buildings and that's what the law is attempting to speak to or the, the bill is attempting to speak to. But well, you know, I appreciate that. Are there other questions for Devin? Devin, thank you. And if you could just find out what the general- Senator Sears, um, could I ask yeah. her one more question? So Can I just Devin, finish my comment? Oh, I'm sorry. If you could just finish, find out the uh, regarding the, all uh, hospitals have signage and et cetera, and have they had any uh, encounters with, with violations of that signage? Not necessarily, even, even tobacco, I'd be interested in how they then enforce that. You know, if somebody walks into the, you know, I saw a picture yesterday of somebody smoking a joint in the capital of the United States of America. Um, and I think that they took that selfie because they were so proud of themselves. I'm not sure I'm proud of them. Senator Sears, I can say that many hospital policies require the healthcare worker to call security to, they have sort of, they go through a list of what you do, which is first to ask that person to secure the weapon in a locked place in their car and come back. And if they refuse to do that, then security is called and if security doesn't work, then I yeah. could go back and check and see if the and what happens after that. But again, if you could, if you could just check on the incidents as well as the policies of the, all yeah. the hospitals. Senator yeah. White has a question. No, I'm I'm fine. Thanks. Senator Benning has a comment or question. Uh, just a, a question: the Dartmouth incident. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did that involve a son who shot his terminally ill mother? He shot, I don't know if the mother was terminally ill. She was in the ICU for, um, uh, and I'm forgetting the word. I'm, I don't know if she was terminally ill. I believe she had um, like a blood clot and, and a blood, uh, brain aneurysm Okay. that she was recovering from. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Karen Horn, uh, the Vermont League of Cities and, Cities, Cities and Towns. Karen, welcome Thank to the Senate Judiciary. Thank Happy you. New Year Thank to you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, right. Happy New Year. <laughs> uh, this is my first time in the in New York committee this year. Right. Um, and thank you for asking our opinion on S30. Uh, we had a board meeting last week on Thursday, and the League of Cities and Towns board voted unanimously to support the intent of this legislation. Clearly, they are frontline with the, the general population, 
and they're frequently called on to make decisions that might anger uh, somebody who the decision affects. So we find that, that it's very um, important to address this issue. So the, the board did have a few suggestions regarding language. The first being that um, we think it would be helpful to be very clear that we're talking about public government buildings because there are other places in the statute where um, public buildings are defined. It might be an apartment complex and um, you know, there's a lot of public buildings, but I think what's, in, what's key here that you're trying to target is government buildings. Uh, they were a little bit concerned about the phrase essential government functions that that might um, encompass a, a really wide range of responsibilities that's difficult to define in statute. And if you're going to use that term, we feel like it does need to be defined, but maybe the a uh, more targeted way to, to approach the whole issue is to uh, focus on public government buildings. And then the third uh, recommendation that board members had was that you might actually look to the tobacco statutes. Your committee had a discussion last week about what about outside of buildings and um, in the tobacco statutes, and I and I copied the the language in my memo to you. Uh, it says that um, you can't smoke within 25 feet of state-owned buildings and offices, except if that 25-foot zone uh, goes onto another person's property. You know, but that there's some um, there's some standard there. So if if we were asking people to secure weapons in their cars, for instance, that they would be able to do that in the parking lot, but they would not be able to bring them closer than 25 feet to the building. It's um, something for uh, the committee to consider. And um, those uh, are essentially are finally given recent events and actually not so recent events in some local jurisdictions around the country. So we've been for fortunate to date in Vermont, but that's it, we've been fortunate. There's not um, another reason. I had kind of a, over the weekend, a um, email conversation with the town manager of Manchester regarding the bill. And some of the things that he suggested and that I suggested in talking about it are similar to what you suggested, certainly making clear which public buildings, but maybe leaving it to the towns to decide, for example, um, is it necessary? Yes, the town hall, which is the office building for the town of Manchester, obviously, but what about the salt shed? Um, is it necessary there? Um, you know, those types of decisions, leaving that up to the communities to determine which buildings, which government we, buildings. Yeah, we had a conversation about that, letting municipalities establish the parameters for their community, but we do think, apologies to Senator White, we do think that in this instance, um, it's important to be clear and to have one standard that applies across the state to government buildings. So. Well, that does mean that we need to better define central government buildings. What you suggested. Yeah. Or, Senator White. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, that, that, that's fine. Or, oh. or to define the the buildings, I mean, if you wanted to specifically I don't exclude up. salt sheds, but yeah. I don't know why you would need to carry a weapon into a salt shed. I don't um, either. But, but uh, no, you could. I, I'm more of the parking lot, et cetera, those issues. 
Um, I would point out that in Bennington, a town office building, I can park right next to the building. So a 25 foot um, perimeter wouldn't help me at all because I right. wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to park in any of the locations right near the building. That's what I was going to say too, is that <clears throat> there are many town halls where you park right beside it. And if you had a 25 foot perimeter, you couldn't even put it in your car. Right. And if I, I mean, go to the other side of the parking lot, I'm at the courthouse. Where right. You can't. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Right. Anyway, uh, just a thought. Uh, Senator White, did you have a comment or question? No, that was that was my comment. Was that the 25 specifying 25 feet is um, problematic and problematic, and I and I think that while it uh, takes some burden off the town uh, local select board to make those determinations, um, I'm always at the, it, my uh, goal is always to allow the local select boards to make their own decisions. And so, um, so Karen, Karen knows this, but, um, and I, I just, I, I guess I, I don't, um, I not, nothing, nothing. Okay. I'm, Other questions for Karen? Senator Bennett. Karen, I'm just going to respond. You made the statement, why would anybody need to carry an assault shit? Um, I'm going to try to red flag this every time I hear it. This is a constitutional right we're talking about. And when somebody starts the conversation by saying, why do you need to have that right at this location? To me, it turns the constitution right on its head. I understand that there is a desire to protect people in certain places. And we're walking a very fine line trying to do that. Uh, earlier, I don't know if you heard the testimony about 3705 being a remedy potentially for this problem. But it seems to me if everybody put a sign out front of their business and said no weapons here, um, eventually you get to the point where your constitutional right is literally useless. And I'll just caveat all this by saying, I don't carry a gun. I used to be able to say I don't have one until I had my father-in-law's ancient shotgun handed to us as a hereditary um, memory of him. But the long and the short of it is this constitutional right shouldn't be having to be defended on the question of why do you need to exercise it here? I can understand many of your businesses may have a legitimate concern about why they should be able to say, we don't want this here for whatever reason. And I'm trying to walk through a fine line in my own head on how to approach this subject. But I really get nervous when a constitutional right has to be defended on the basis of why do you have to do it? Uh, because that really sets us up on a slippery slope that I'm uncomfortable with. And I, I suspect your businesses really ought to have that conversation so that we can at least narrow down who really is in need of having some kind of protection, as opposed to us issuing a carte blanche government top-down statement that all businesses under a given category are simply prevented because there are little nuances. Like the earlier example of a child care center in Gilhall, there may be very good reasons why we don't want to incorporate them in this conversation. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Well, Senator, um, your yeah, go ahead. Uh, Karen? comment is, your, your comment is well taken. That was careless of me, sorry. Um, but uh, we are talking about local government, not businesses, and the statutes have pretty significantly constrained the authority of local governments um, regarding 
uh, bulk manner of issues relating to firearms. Uh, so we do think it would be very helpful for the legislature to state quite clearly where um, those firearms may not be carried in, in government buildings. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there, but. I just want to say, I didn't, mean, I didn't want to put you on the defensive. That wasn't my intent. I'm actually hoping that in conversations about this as we go forward, you would go back to your businesses and ask that very question. Uh, because I think it's important for all of us. We're, we're not really but talking some, about businesses, though. Right. But at times, my personal, uh, someone's personal rights, for example, to post their land and suggest that they don't want hunting on their land so when you know is somebody else's right where they've always gone to that land it's the personal property right we've seen those battles over the years uh, I, and then if if store a doesn't want somebody to bring a firearm into their store they have a right to say no that's a personal property right i guess I agree that I agree that they do. Oh, Dick. They, they might come in conflict. The both constitutional rights could come into conflict. Just one of them. Yeah, my my neighbor just happened to post property that has been unposted for eons. I think he has that right. But if government was to say all property is posted, but that's the conversation we're in right no. now. No, I understand. But if 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 forty businesses in Bennington decided to post a sign saying no weapons. They have a right to do that. They're private businesses. Senator Baruth. I, I just want to make it very clear because <clears throat> whenever you present any bill regarding firearms, the number one argument against you is that it's the entering wedge, it's the nose under the tent, it's a slippery slope. And so I'm leery about having this conversation drift off into private businesses, et cetera, because ultimately it won't hurt the argument of those who oppose the bill, it will hurt the bill. The bill is very purposefully tailored around three locations and the reasons for those I've repeated a number of times. So I, I wouldn't wanna send our witnesses off to produce additional pieces of legislation or uh, mission creep in terms of our conversation. As far as I'm concerned, S30 is only concerned with hospitals, government buildings, and childcare centers. So when we when we begin to have a discussion about um, private businesses, I, I feel as though we're we're just drifting from where the bill very clearly intends to to go. I think child care centers are private businesses, Philip, and that's yes, they are. a conversation we have to have. Okay. Um, Senator White. Uh, for the wit, let's get back to the witness. <laughs> yeah, no, I just was going to say, Karen, that um, if 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 it's all government businesses, um, I mean, all government buildings of any sort, that does include the the town garage and the salt shed and the um, and it does, and I don't think it just, I don't know in this case if government includes all municipalities. So if it would include the, the transfer stations, um, I, I don't know how government is um, defined here. So there are many, many um, municipalities that are not towns or schools that are <clears throat> um, private nonprofit um, uh, fire, fire stations that are a municipality. Um, and water <coughs> districts and transfer stations. So I, I don't know how um, far the definition goes here. I hadn't thought about that before. Okay. Um, other questions for Karen? Thank you. Um, Karen, thanks for being here. Well, I'm sure we'll see you again on some issue. Um, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, the next witness is Kagan Mays Williams, Council for Everyone, everyone. I'm sorry, Every Town for Gun Safety. I knew I'd screw something up in that title. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Sear. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, and good morning. <laughs> um, I am uh, from Every Town for Gun Safety. My name is Keegan Mays Williams, uh, and I serve as legislative counsel here. Uh, this is my second session working in Vermont. I had the privilege of testifying before the House Judiciary Committee. So I really do appreciate the opportunity at last session. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to be with you all here today in the Senate. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I do want to thank Senate Baruth for introducing uh, what we feel is a very important bill uh, and a bill that I think will uh, offer common sense gun violence prevention protection uh, for people in Vermont, uh, people who are at their most vulnerable moments in hospitals, daycare centers, and public buildings. Uh, I agree that um, while right now I can define an es essential government function, this wonderful con conversation that we're having right now, it may not be clear to others what, what that government function means. I have my own ideas of what an essential government function is, um, but it would be great for the bill to be more clear about what that is. But what we do see is that this bill is responsive to uh, you know, the current rise and threat of armed extremism in this country today. Uh, over the past year and over the past couple of days of this year, legislators all over the country, uh, I'm hoping not uh, present company included, have received multiple threats uh, simply for doing their jobs. I believe between May and December 2020, there have been at least 85 instances of armed protests at state capitals involving guns. Uh, so I think a bill like this removes the likelihood that any death threats or threats of violence from afar will uh, materialize into any actual violence where someone is able to legally access a building. Um, I understand uh, that there has been a lot of conversation uh, during this meeting about the intention of the person holding the firearm. Uh, it is our view that carrying a firearm or being in possession of a firearm uh, necessarily intimidates citizens and emboldens uh, people who uh, are uh, presently possessing that gun, those guns for the purpose of intimidating others. Um, and as we can see, as earlier this month, uh, what can start as a peaceful protest can morph into an insurrection or escalate into a gunfight. Um, I've listened to a number of the witnesses, the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services did make clear that uh, her department is in charge of deciding whether or not there'll be firearms inside of the buildings. Um, and uh, we, I'm sure the people of Vermont are so grateful that she has continued that prohibition. However, mm -hmm. if there is another commissioner who decides differently, uh, it would be great to have a law in the code that uh, protects cap to state capital and other buildings uh, that are publicly leased uh, in the future. I, I also noticed that uh, the Department of Buildings and General Services does not exclude firearms from the grounds. Um, there have been a lot of conversations about concerns about the perimeter and the ability to park. Um, I think the ability to uh, add a provision which requires lock storage of a gun in the vehicle could cure that concern while also having the added benefit of ensuring that uh, people who are uh, entering a space where a government function is taking place um, are doing so without the ability to carry a weapon. Um, you know, I, I know that our, our view or the way that we are thinking of this as more in terms of defense of First Amendment rights. Uh, peaceful protest is an essential form of an expression of and a pillar of American democracy and uh, the dangers that are inherent in carrying firearms at demonstrations are really clear. So I would argue that SB 30 could go even further uh, to prohibit uh, firearms uh, during uh, at public locations, uh, or at least I would include that into the definition as an essential government function. Uh, vote counting facilities, that, that's also an essential government function that should not uh, bear the intimidation of uh, a firearm. 
Um, also during demonstrations on public property, I would argue that uh, guns should be prohibited from that place as well. Um, and, and I understand that that may uh, be an unpopular view, but uh, given the current, the current state, um, I think that it is necessary. I wanted to add a fourth type of person uh, to this uh, bad person, good person, uh, sick person uh, analogy that uh, seems to have been presented. I want to introduce, introduce a fourth person who may otherwise be reasonable, who is incensed um, when protesting or advocating for a belief of which they hold very deeply and dearly. And so all I'm saying is that I would not want uh, one constitutional right to overpower another. Let's take the possibility of lethal violence out of the equation. Um, you know, uh, there have been other people who have said that safety is the true concern, that the ability to possess your firearm may necessarily make you feel more safe. Um, it, you know, it cannot be ignored that uh, at times it's been shown that introducing guns into a high stress situation can only increase the threat of injury or possibility of death. Uh, so I, I would, the last thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, uh, if Vermont were to act on this bill, it would not be alone. Uh, just last week in the Virginia House of Delegates, um, they passed five bills, which are now headed to the floor. Um, and that legislation includes a ban on guns in the Capitol and the Capitol Square and guns at polling places in Washington state. There is legislation that's pending, uh, banning firearms from Capitol Browns and at public demonstrations in Oregon. Uh, there's a hearing on legislation to pro prohibit guns in public buildings. Uh, and also in Michigan, there are two bills that would prohibit carry on Capitol premises. So Vermont would not be alone um, in, in really responding to this particular moment. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions and then I'll go to Senator Baruth. Um, <clears throat> how do you respond to Mr. Davis's uh, testimony? By removing the ability of good people to defend themselves, we've removed the deterrence for bad people to be armed. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Sears. I, I know that there are, of course, no law can completely uh, take away the uh, ability for a person who would like to do harm to another to do harm. Um, but we do have uh, a wealth of laws on the books for the purpose of deterring people from committing certain actions. Um, as I've listened here today, it appears as though the firearm prohibition in schools uh, and in um, excuse me, uh, in courts in Vermont has been terribly effective in preventing any type of harm. Uh, and it appears that SB 30, uh, you know, I've heard everyone say that there hasn't been any incidents yet, um, but given the current climate, I would hope that SB 30 could ensure that, uh, that there would not be a future event where someone was hurt. <clears throat> Senator Baruth had a question. You're muted, Senator. It I gives me great to... pleasure to finally say that to you, <laughs> that you're muted, because it's usually me that's muted. I did want to thank the witness uh, for her testimony. And then to pick up on um, what Ms. Keegan Williams said about, Keegan Mays Williams said about, uh, the different pieces of legislation in motion around the country, those are all areas that have, um, that have seen real violence, attempted takeovers of their capitals, plots against their governors, uh, you know, al almost science fiction like events. Um, and that's what's moving them to act. I think some people would then say, well, we haven't seen exactly the same thing in Vermont, but the point, and, and I think this is missed sometimes by gun rights advocates, Vermont is 
inextricably linked with the rest of the country via the internet. And the way this radicalization spreads is via the internet. And, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, gun rights groups, like every other group, organize using the internet. And radical groups like the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, et cetera, the Proud Boys, they also use the internet as their main recruiting and information dissemination tool. So it's not an accident that we're seeing uh, a radicalization in many open carry states. That's the place where it makes sense uh, for people who have in their mind to destabilize government to do their organizing. That's one of the reasons why this bill comes forward in Vermont. So as the witness says, we've been fortunate thus far, but we are not immune from what's going on in terms of the national online radicalization. Um, and, you know, I think if I point back to when we passed the, uh, the ban on high capacity magazines, within a few days, there was a rally on the state house lawn where they gave away high capacity magazines for free. And that's not something that I would associate with traditional Vermont. That's a kind of radical posture that we will freely distribute high capacity weapons um, to individuals as a way of making a political point. And that happened in Vermont. And it, I found it very unsettling to have that happening on the state house lawn. So um, all the way of saying that, I think we have been fortunate, but we need like the rest of the country and especially the other open carry states to be rethinking exactly where we do and don't want weapons. Well, I, I, uh, I want to just comment on that. I've found many protests to be um, inappropriate over the years, but people have a right to those types of protests. You know, I, I found the protest uh, on the inauguration of Peter Sullins in his last term to be inappropriate. But that people had a right to do that. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to get into which was inappropriate, which wasn't. The question here really is how do we deal with what is a very um, how do we deal with this issue that you've raised, which is firearms in public buildings, or government buildings, excuse me, and hospitals and um, healthcare centers? I, we've, we've heard from a number of folks about that, and that's what this discussion is really about. Um, I appreciate uh, the discussion about what's going on nationally, but I'm I'm more concerned with what's going on in Vermont and how Vermonters are viewing it and how's, what, what's our best, uh, what do we do with this bill? Senator White. Well, I was just, I was just gonna say, and I, I'm not, I, I, you know I have some concerns with this, but I also <laughs> wanna say that one of the things that's happening in Vermont, and I think I'm right in saying this is that, um, while there were calls for um, people to protest and um, uh, all kinds of things on the inauguration day, that my understanding is that the four major gun groups in Vermont actually asked their members not to do it because um, of the fear of, of um, what might happen. And so I, I I, I don't want to look at just what's happening nationally, but what's actually happening in Vermont. And I think that I'm right in saying that, that, that they did ask them. And I, I also wonder if um, there is a fear of radicalization. And um, it seems that, I, I, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I wonder if, if the more, the more, um, actions we take against the right to be armed, if that um, 
gives fodder for even more radicalization because it gives more reason to, I, I don't know that for a fact, but I just wonder sometimes um, with kids, when you tell them not to do something, then they get angrier about it. And um, the more you tell them not to, the more fodder they have for um, doing, doing it. So just, just a thought. Uh, hey, Senator Benning. So first, I'd just like to respond to Senator Berth that he was uncomfortable about that group that met to protest on the State House lawn on the 30 round mags. Um, you described that as being anti Vermont. I personally no. would counter that. Well, you, you made a reference to Vermont and that being. I can't remember your exact words. I just wanted to say, in my eyes, that's exactly what Vermont is all about. People have a right to protest in support of their constitutional rights. Um, we're going to have more of this conversation, I should say, for all the folks, especially the witness now testifying. Senator Baruth and I have been on opposite sides of this equation, but we also go out to lunch every week when it's not COVID blocked. Um, so we're not in by any stretch um, that far into opposite camps that we don't have the ability to reach out and try to figure out what the other one is up to. Um, but Ms. Kagan Mays Williams, you did say that with respect to this bill, you thought there should be some tightening up of the description. Um, and I believe you were talking about public buildings and where things actually would be. I didn't know whether you had any language that you were gonna propose as a result of that. But if you do, I'd like to see what that is. Hi. Thank you, uh, Senator Benning. I, I think my, I, I wanted more clarification as to what constituted a, an essential government function. Um, I appreciate that in Vermont, uh, for example, um, I'm not exactly sure where polling takes place, where the polling stations are. They may be at schools, they may be, um, you know, obviously uh, firearms are prohibited at schools at, at, at all times, but just to ensure that firearms are prohibited, for example, during the essential government function of uh, conducting an election or, so I just wanted to be clear because I'm uh, making assumptions of what I think to be an essential government function, uh, committee meetings, uh, committee votes, a house uh, floor votes, um, so I, but happy to offer examples um, if, if if that would be appreciated. Yeah, I, I don't know how long you've been watching this testimony over the past couple of days, but the bottom line is we've been struggling with that question. And um, you're now talking about polling places, which are a municipal uh, form of government. And I didn't know whether if you had some clear thoughts on what suggested language would be, whether it be municipal, state level, or even federal level for that matter. Uh, but if you did, I would love to see whatever that is. Thanks. Sure, I would happy. I'd, I'd be happy to offer. Thank you, uh, Senator Baruth. Uh, just just a quick comment, and then I'll uh, I'll not beat a dead horse. But um, to back to uh, Senator Benning's comment about that demonstration where they handed out high capacity magazines, being Vermont, those high capacity magazines were provided by an out of state interest that purchased them, transported them into the state, and then gave them out for free to Vermonters. That's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the radicalization of Vermont. It didn't come that rally and those, um, the rally may have started by in-state interests, but those particular weapons or the, the magazines were provided by people from out of Vermont. And so, the idea that Vermont is increasing one's arsenal, I, I don't go along with. I am all for traditional hunting and shooting. I'm all for people being able to have the weapons they choose to have, but we are, are naive if we don't believe that there are forces larger than Vermont that are in play in our state, both for and against bills like this. Um, so I, I want to um, just clarify that, uh, what I was trying to say is that 
in terms of open carry states being flashpoints in government buildings, we are not immune from that. Fortunately, we've been spared it so far. But, uh, you know, I, I said this before, when we've had public events in the state house where gun rights people have come in, I have myself had to walk the gauntlet from my committee room to my car past hundreds of people dressed in hunting clothes who recognize me and act aggressively toward me in the state house. It's not a comfortable feeling. Um, I am comforted by the thought that probably those people left their weapons in their car. I would be additionally comforted if it was illegal for them to bring them into the state house. I, I would love to have this conversation. I miss our lunches, frankly, but when one of Benning, us- May I suggest that you and Senator Baruth have a virtual lunch someday this <laughs> week um, to settle Happy your- to do it. And, Happy to do it. But, but may I further suggest that we come back to the witness and if there are questions for the witness um, that uh, we have, we thank uh, her for being here. Um, we are, uh, I don't have any further questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate it. <clears throat> um, we are going to take this bill up again on Friday at 1145. And let me explain why. That was the only time that we could schedule a physician to represent the Vermont Medical Society. So that's why we're going to do this again. Um, at some point in the near future, um, I would like to hear, as I said earlier, uh, about, devote two hours of committee testimony to um, Mr. Bradley's group and Mr. Davis's group and uh, two other groups that you have, Senator Baruth, uh, maybe a half an hour each, they can choose their own witnesses. That will make it easier for Peggy to organize um, what would then be more of a public forum. Mm -hmm. You would let Peggy know which two. And Karen, you had a question or comment? Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on my comment about municipalities in particular being constrained. Um, the statute at Title 24, Section 2291, Sub 8, allows municipal to prohibit the use or discharge, but not possession of firearms within the municipality or specified portions thereof. That's the law that's on the book today. So I wanted to just point that out to you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. And then another witness that we may have is uh, Aaron Goins from the National Rifle Association. So uh, let me know, uh, or Peggy know, and Eric, you're continuing to research other laws and their impact. But I, I think it's clear at least that um, if we go forward with the bill, we need to um, make a, do a few amendments on a, a couple of places there, particularly on what is an essential government function and uh, there was a couple of other places where we really it, it needs needs to be worked on. Yeah, I've been taking notes as we went along, and I'm sure committee members also will have thoughts about language that that needs rework if we get to that point. But I've also got some record of that. But I, if, I'm intrigued by 27. No, it's, 3705. I don't know why I want to make it. Um, yep. Senator Baruth. Uh, I'm wondering, and tell me either way, I'm, I'm fine either way. Would it help if I were to work with Eric, uh, having listened to uh, the committee discussion, to work on a draft, another draft that would come from me? Or would you prefer that we all as a committee uh, work on a next draft? Um, I'm happy to, to do that, uh, have you do that, um, but I'm not sure there are three votes to move a bill out of committee without a lot of committee discussion. I hate to have 
you spend your time on that and Eric's time okay. on that. Um, All right. So I'll, I think I'll, what we I'll, need to we need to arrive at some consensus if we're going to have three votes to move the bill forward. Um, to, I will be up right on the table. I have <clears throat> concerns about um, about the bill, uh, but I also am trying to be open minded um, to the fact that um, I think there are issues in hospitals particularly um, that folks are facing. I want to hear more testimony there. I think um, I'm having trouble with government buildings being so broad. We haven't really, and I, 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 that's one, one that worries me. I didn't realize, you know, I assume we were talking about the town hall or the, you know, municipal office building and the state house and uh, surrounding campus, but I, it seems like it's really expanded to what is a municipal building. Um, and to, to clarify, I'm, I'm fine with uh, clarifying those things, tightening it down, even whittling it to the buildings themselves. Um, but I did want to make clear that <clears throat> I, don't, I don't even at this point um, want to be targeting only three votes. I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that Alice and Joe often vote against a bill like this, but I am definitely still open to trying to find a way that, uh, that not just a bare majority, but a, a strong majority of us could agree to go ahead. Well, it would be nice to have a 5-0 vote. Mm -hmm. Senator White. So when you're looking at um, um, the definition of government buildings or essential government functions, uh, things like um, yeah. our state's attorney office is in another building. They rent a floor on another building that's a commercial building. So if it is the entire building would be um, prohibited here. So I think we need to, there really is some fine tuning that needs to and, be done. And it, you know, um, just to put my cards on the table, if it turned out that the committee was only able to agree on, you know, town halls and the campus of buildings that we deal with in Montpelier, then I would take that as the committee's will. Um, so it may be that there are other um, decentralized offices that we can't cover because it becomes just too difficult. So, you know, I'm, I'm fully open to narrowing this down to a core protection. Thank you. I think what we're gonna do now is adjourn. Um, been a, another great discussion. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I wanna, we're gonna have a joint hearing with the House Judiciary Committee on the uh, RDAP report and uh, it's um, so, uh, at 10.45, we're gonna- Yep, so you'll get two different Zooms from me today, guys, one for the nine to 10.30 and then the one for the joint hearing. Okay. And um, I will let you know um, as you listen to the testimony tomorrow on the RDAP report, I, believe the House has agreed to go first on the legislation that goes with the report. But there are things that government operations would also need to look at in that report, Senator. Yep. Hey, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, or probably see all of you at one o'clock.